Other stories then uh, around the world. If we start with a look at the Washington Post, of course, it's very much focused on that meeting uh, between uh, Kim Jong-un and uh, President Putin. We've mentioned that already, their first ever summit. This article speculates whether it will produce neither statements nor agreements following Trump's meeting breakdown with Kim in Hanoi. If we look now at the front page of the Scottish Times, its headline says the head of the Scottish Government, Nicola Sturgeon, is plotting course for a second referendum to break away from the United Kingdom. Scottish Daily Mail, though, is putting the bid behind a long list of what it says are bigger priorities. BuzzFeed.com is looking at the power of Facebook advertising during the European elections. The article says Nigel Farage's Brexit party is spending almost twice as much as rivals on campaigning on the social media platform. In the meantime, on the continent, groups are lobbying Facebook to relax advertising rules, which currently make advertising in the 28 member states very complicated. Wall Street Journal is looking at May the 1st deadline for new sanctions on buyers of oil from Iran. Tehran is warning the US of consequences for blocking its future oil sales. And then the story says Iran's foreign minister has also suggested prisoner exchanges, of course, which could lead to the freeing of the British, Iranian uh, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe. And BBC.com is looking at uh, the issue of too much money being given to rebuild the Notre Dame. It says at least $835 million has been pledged so far in large and small donations, surpassing its estimated restoration by hundreds of millions of dollars. So the article is looking at what else could be done with that cash. Cornelia is back. Cornelia Mayer, CEO of MRL Corporation. So let's get started. Uh, you and I were talking about the yes. meeting of uh, President Putin earlier and Kim Jong-un. Let's look at the Washington Post. What does it make of this meeting, this first meeting between these two leaders? Well, I mean, it's, it, it pretty much makes the same as everybody. We don't know because there's no real press conference scheduled. We don't expect a real outcome. But it is a, it is, it is a, it is a landmark meeting. And it is the, fir it is the first time that, um, that, that Kim um, is, is, is going to Russia and meet, meeting Russia, which in history has always been a strong ally of, of of the of the um, of of North Korea. Yes, and we can see the pictures here of the two leaders arriving for uh, this moment where they actually met for the very first time. This was around about 40 minutes ago yeah. at the beginning of the briefing uh, today. Um, as you say, it is it is Kim Jong Un's first visit to Russia, and he made that point when he when he first arrived to say, "Look, I've been in leadership now for seven years, and I've not made it here till yeah, now." Yeah, he said, "I always wanted I always wanted to come here." He said he always wanted to come here. You know, this is this is. Um, and, and actually, when you look at the map, Vladivostok itself, where this is all happening, it, it's, it's, it's not very, that far away it's from, very from, and, from and, the you know, border as, of North as Korea. As we said in the previous um, um, slot. Um, you know, it re it's re reminiscent of the six-party talks where you had China, Russia, North Korea, South Korea, Japan, and the U.S. engaged. And it probably makes sense to broaden it out, especially as some of the leaders involved are a little bit erratic. Yes, indeed. So we're keeping a close eye on that meeting. You can see the two leaders here, the body language between them and all the rest of it. It will all be analysed. But I, I doubt that, like with President Trump, they will fall in love. Remember, President <laughs> Trump fell in love with Kim. Yes. <laughs> fell in love and fell out of love, it would seem. Now, let's have a look at other stories. Um, the t we're looking at two papers in Scotland today, mm -hmm. the Scottish Times and Scottish Daily Mail, and their coverage of uh, the news that Nicola Sturgeon is to make a renewed case for Scottish yeah. independence. No big surprise at all because she's been no. quite clear about this. This has been her agenda uh, ever since the first referendum. Absolutely, um, and especially since the Brexit, since the sort of the Brexit absolutely. debacle here. And, um, you know, the Times very much takes sort of a descriptive view. This is what she wants to do. She wants to have a soft Brexit. She wants to really get also her opposition involved. She wants to learn from the, the, the mistakes of Brexit. The, 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 the Scottish Daily Mail rightly says, well, is this really our first priority? Um, you know, we have so many NHS 
stress crisis, education filing, the economy stuttering, public services crumbling, and, and, and the whole um, rigmarine of, 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 um, of things um, to look at. It's very, I mean, that is the danger of Brexit, you know. It, um, it, 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 it is not helpful for the unity, but where I think Sturgeon may have an uphill battle. She says, oh, we will leave the UK and then we'll go into the EU. Well, the EU may not want them because if you look at the whole, the EU has rather strict, you know, has rather strict um, guidelines on how much, you, how big your deficit can be yeah. way out I there. I mean, they are strict, but, it, but the yeah. rules have been broken by yeah, many Yeah, the rules have states. been broken, but I think, look what happened when the rules were broken. Look at Greece, look at Italy. So well, they are they getting... Were, they were bailed out, they, and Italy wasn't. Yeah, yeah, but. yeah, but do they really want another laggard in there? So I wouldn't be too confident that the EU will immediately say, oh, yes, um, come and join us. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, to see uh, both articles and, and, and what they say about this and actually what the appetite is like in Scotland for... Yeah a second referendum it's because the first one I, I mean we remember it well here we covered yeah. it closely yeah. and and it and it was pretty close and it was it was really fractious at the, at that time yeah and it if, was if, it if was a mini it was like a mini brexit in terms of divisiveness all right let's move on then to uh the european elections and they are may the 23rd not far away at all and this article buzzfeed is looking at yeah. nigel farage's brexit party outspending most when it comes to uh, the money it's putting into advertising through facebook yeah or and political messages on facebook on first facebook yeah but it's not it's not that much money but they're, they're outspending most but it, it seems to be working when you look there was a there was a um, a headline over the weekend that 40 percent of um uh, Tory councillors would vote for the Brexit party in the European election. So clearly they're doing something right. They're targeting these over 40s. I guess these are the sort of conservative um, Tory councillor types. Mm. Um, and so, so they're, they're clearly doing something right. I mean, I, when, I, when I read that, that headline, I nearly fell off my chair. But also at the same chair. time, they're, they're, they're asking, you know, elsewhere within Europe for, for Facebook to... Uh, alleviate some of its strict yeah. rules about how yeah, you but, know, political but, messages but, but are put you, on Facebook. But, but you, can't, you can't have it both ways. You know, on one hand we say, okay, we need to be very careful that foreign powers cannot take over. So, you know, like the Russian incident with, with in Brexit in, um, in the US election. But then the EU says, oh, but by the way, we want to, so now Facebook has very strict rules. If you want to, adv if you want to do political ads in a country, you need to register in the country and you can only do it in that country and now the EU wants it to wants it all ways you can't ha you can't have them go tighter and then for certain things go broader that's difficult okay let's move on to uh, Wall Street Journal and its take on uh, the news we got earlier this week from the Trump administration that from the beginning of May any waivers anything of that nature that were available to those who bought oil from Iran would finish. Um, this article looks at Iran's top diplomat warning the US of the implications of this move. Well, it, 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 this? it doesn't really warn them of the implications of the move. It just says if we will still export our oil via the Straits of Hormuz, and guys, if you block us in the Straits of Hormuz, these narrow straits where the Iranian yeah. oil ships out, you know, be prepared for the consequences. That's what it really says. And you know, Actually, I have lots of friends in the oil business and, and, and many of them say that the Iranians will smuggle out a lot. It is really difficult for the Indians. It is difficult for the people with refineries. India imports a lot Im of oil from yeah, Iran. From Iran and their refineries need heavy oil. And they import from Iran and Venezuela. Venezuela has fallen off a cliff. Iran, if they can't import from Iran, they will need Saudi UAE crude. The US has only exports sweet crude. That doesn't Where fit do you their think refineries. Oil prices, just quickly, where do you think the price of oil is headed, given all of this going on, etc.? Well, I think it's, it's currently sort of, I would say it could go up to 80, but then at some stage it will naturalize again, because don't forget, um, last December, OPEC and its 10 friends, OPEC Plus, took out 1.2 million barrels. And if Iranian exports, or because there was a, a, a glut of oil, if Iranian exports go to zero, that's 1 point, 1, between 1 and 1.3 billion million barrels, they will smuggle some, so it's maybe one or less, so we will have enough. All right. 
I shall hold you to that, Cornelia, in the weeks and months to come. Do! Um, <laughs> Let's quickly look at this story about Notre Dame. Just one comment. <clears throat> it's on BBC Online. Notre Dame Fire has too much money been given to rebuild it, it asks. Over $800 uh, million has been raised so far. But such is the thing when you have private money. Private money, um, you know, especially when you have ultra-rich like here, they will decide where it goes. The private money foundations, they decide what their priority is. There's very little you can do. <laughs> There you go. Thanks, Cornelia. Good to get that short response on that one. She does deliver, doesn't she?